Bloom went to London to discuss plans for a collective security treaty with the British. Before he went, he ordered that arms be sent to Spain. At this meeting with Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, Spain was not officially on the agenda, but Bloom discussed it anyway. On his return to Paris, he reported the conversation to Jules Mock, a member of his government. Bloom told me of his talks with Eden. And the extraordinary non-European stance that both Eden and his colleagues were taking. Eden told Bloom we shouldn't get mixed up in it, that even if war broke out in Europe over Spain, England, who was distant from all that, would remain neutral. Therefore, since France could not count on support from England, it would be wise for her to adopt the same position as the English. And I think I can recall that Bloom told me that that would be a cowardly position. In London, the British national government was worried. Conservative Prime Minister Baldwin and his ministers were concerned at all costs to avoid another world war and feared it could start in Spain. Alec Douglas Hume was then a backbencher. If uh, um, country after country began to take part in the war, then nobody could see the end of it and it could uh, end up in a big European conflict. Mussolini was careering around in the Mediterranean and making all sorts of trouble. Uh, Japan was restive, and of course, German realm was in full flood. And so we were very apprehensive about getting entangled in any other uh, situation. Britain's attitude didn't help the French Prime Minister, Leon Blum, his plan for keeping European peace by protecting Spain was also in trouble at home. His policy of unrestricted military sales had threatened to split his government and might have precipitated serious civil unrest. He therefore reversed his original decision to send arms to Spain and devised another policy to save his face. On August 2nd, the French cabinet announced that they had decided to appeal urgently to interested governments for a pact of non-intervention. The British government, supported at this stage by its Labour opposition, responded eagerly. I think France and Britain felt exactly the same on this issue. We did not want to get embroiled. And Mr. Blum, Mr. Blum um, thought of the policy of non-intervention, which wasn't a heroic policy at all. But nevertheless, it was a pragmatic policy. As France closed its borders, the Spanish Republic felt let down. Under international law, it was legally entitled to buy arms abroad. But non-intervention stopped that. No one had ever claimed heroic intention for the policy. It was a diplomatic stratagem, a framework in which everyone could safely pursue their individual ends. They would fight their battles without actually going to war. No one thought it could curtail hostilities in Spain, or even that it should. Spain provided a safety valve to siphon off the political passions of Europe at that time. Nowadays, when you say fascist, you think of violence or dictatorship. But at that time, we youngsters didn't know anything else. We had been brought up and educated under fascism. We were convinced that it could be a valid formula to solve social problems. Not all Italians were so convinced. Giovanni Pesci had been brought up in France. His parents had fled there to escape Mussolini's Italy. The fight for the Spanish people was also a fight against Italian fascism. This was the reason I came voluntarily to fight in Spain. La Passinaria, whose real name was Dolores Ibaruri, was a communist member of the Spanish parliament. Her rhetoric rallied worldwide support for the republic. 
La Passionaria, a Parigi, la... La Passionaria had come to Paris to ask for support, for help from the French people and the French government. She finished her speech by saying, if Spain is defeated, the world will be flooded with blood. And so I, a young, very young, militant of the anti-fascist movement, said that I must also go to give my contribution. In Germany, communists have been the first target of Hitler's terror. And so when Hitler made clear his support for Franco, German communists knew which side they were on. I believe that for us German anti-fascists, it was more poignant than for anybody else. We had tangibly experienced Hitler. Thousands of German anti-fascists were already in prisons and concentration camps, and we immediately recognized the connection between Franco's intentions and those of Hitler. The politics of economic depression spilled over from the cities of Europe to a full-scale battlefield in Spain. It was mainly communists who travelled to do the fighting. Frank Deegan was an unemployed communist docker from Liverpool. I believed that if Hitler and Mussolini managed to help Franco to win, then this would be a defeat for the whole labour movement throughout the world. We thought, you know, the fascists of the world were ganging together so a call went out uh, for volunteers to help the Republican government. The call came from Moscow. The International Committee of Communist Leaders, a Comintern, organized an international column of volunteers. Stalin himself, however, had his doubts. He was wooing Britain and France as allies against the Nazi threat and didn't want them scared off by communist intervention in Spain. He held back from sending arms. He did send advisers, ambassadors, and food. When the first Russian ship arrived in Barcelona, initial rapture gave way to disappointment when the consignment turned out to be not the guns that the Republic wanted, but canned milk. The guns only came later. Meanwhile, the Italian foreign minister Giano met Hitler at Bertesgaden in Germany. They agreed that their aid to the Spanish army rebels had to be increased, partly to counter Russian aid, and partly because Hitler had now decided he wanted to go over to the attack against the democracies. What had previously been a reflex action, a decision to supply Spain on request, became a concrete policy, a joint front against communism. A few days after Ciano and Hitler's meeting, Mussolini was heard for the first time to refer to the Rome-Berlin axis. Events in Spain had drawn Italy and Germany closer together, a step down the path towards the Second World War. I hate war! America. The world was very different in 1936. America was not the fulcrum of the world's foreign policy decisions still in dogged isolation from Europe's affairs. Roosevelt ignored the Spanish conflict and allowed the Texas Oil Company to supply Franco with fuel. In London, the non-intervention powers examined allegations of Italian, German and Portuguese intervention. The committee was chaired by the British. No one wanted the charges to stick, and they didn't. Von Ribbentrop, the German ambassador, later joked, a more appropriate name for the organization would have been the Intervention Committee. Nowhere was this intervention clearer than in a battle for Madrid. Until October, the skies were dominated by the rebels, reinforced by German and Italian planes. The Spanish Republican Air Force was no match until Soviet planes arrived. 